Welcome everybody to Nonviolence Radio. I'm Stephanie Van Hook and I'm here in the studio with my co-host and news anchor Michael Negler. Good morning, Michael. Thanks for being in the studio with me today. Good morning, Stephanie. Wouldn't be any other place this morning. So today we have with us Kathy Kelly. Uh, For those of you in the peace movement, she really needs no introduction, somebody who has completely dedicated her life to ending war and violence. She's one of the founding members of Voices in the Wilderness, later known as Voices for Creative Nonviolence, which closed its campaign in 2020 because of difficulty traveling into war zones. We'll hear more about that. Uh, She is co-coordinator of the Ban Killer Drones campaign and an activist with World Beyond War. And we have her with us today on Nonviolence Radio to talk about Afghanistan. She's been there nearly 30 times. And as somebody who is an American dedicated to ending war, hearing about her experiences and and what's going on there now uh, from, from her perspective is going to be very helpful as we continue and deepen our conversations about Afghanistan as that's in the news today. So uh, welcome to Nonviolence Radio, Kathy Kelly. Well, thank you, Stephanie and Michael. It's always a a reassuring thing to know that the two of you are working as well as you do to promote nonviolence and to try to better understand the consequences of our, our, our warfares. Well, coming from you, Kathy, that is very reassuring. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, where do you find yourself today? Are you are you in Chicago? Well, I'm in the Chicago area, and um, in a way, my, my heart and my mind are often uh, through email and social media with, uh, oh, I guess about five dozen young Afghans that I... Um, was so fortunate to get to know through visits to Afghanistan, all of whom are in fairly precarious situations, and some more so than others, and thinking a great deal about what could even begin to be a nonviolent way forward for them. Well, let's just jump right into that then, Kathy. Can you speak to to what is happening in, in, in your heart and mind and what is going on from your perspective? Well, I do feel a great deal of sorrow and regret. I live in comfort and security that is pure accident of birth, and yet I live in the country where a lot of our comfort and security has been enabled by an economy whose top crop is weapons. And how do we get those weapons marketed and sold and used mm-hmm. and then sell more? Well, we have to market our wars. And, the, you know, the idea that many people... Well, mainly they just forgot about Afghanistan. Would, if they gave it a thought, and and I don't mean this to sound judgmental, but many U.S. people thought, well, aren't we sort of helping the women and children over Mm -hmm. there? And that that really wasn't true. There were some women who made gains unquestionably um, in urban areas. But, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what if the United States hadn't been dedicated to building 500 bases all across Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. What if we hadn't saturated the areas around those spaces and really all throughout the country with our weapons? What if the ordinance that we dropped through many, many, many bombings and many which went totally unrecorded because the drone warfare didn't, the CIA and other groups weren't required to even keep lists of who it was that they bombed? You know, what if the United States had entirely focus its considerable energies and resources on finding out what do Afghans need and then certainly helping rehabilitate the agricultural infrastructure because everybody needs food. So all Mm. of those what-ifs come to mind and, and, and a feeling of regret and yet also You know, I'm very much reminded of an article that Erica Chenoweth, Dr. Erica Chenoweth, Mm -hmm. um, at the time she was in Colorado, and Dr. Hakim, uh, the mentor for the um, group of these young Afghan friends. We don't even name them anymore. It's Mm -hmm. become so dangerous for them. The two of them wrote that sometimes the most nonviolent action someone can take in an extremely 
violent situation is to flee. And so, I mean, just this morning, somebody who's a pretty astute observer, he I, we'd known him for a long time in Afghanistan, and he actually worked with the government uh, as an aide to an, a, a member of parliament. He said he can see that war is probably coming, more war in between these various factions. And so what do you do? Well, so many have said, I, I want to go to get out for their own safety, but also because they don't want to pick up guns. They don't want to fight. They don't want to continue cycles of revenge and retaliation. And so for those who have fled to places like Pakistan, they're still not safe, really. Um, but I, I feel a, a, a sort of, I can't help but feel some relief. Well, at least you're somewhat out of danger. And then I, you know, here we are in the United States where our tax dollars funded all of this chaos and upheaval over many, many years that was caused by warring parties and the United States being the most well healed. And yet we don't, we don't feel a tremor, you know, necessarily. Anyway, that's what's been on my mind. Thank you for asking. Oh, you're so welcome, Kathy. I'm having two thoughts with response to what you just shared. Uh, one of the latest thing you said is, and I bet you'd probably agree with me, is I, I bet on some level of our collective mind and our individual mind, that isn't entirely true that we're getting off scot-free. And mm -hmm. you know there's such a thing as moral injury, and uh, this is the injury that people cause themselves by injuring others, which registers deep in their mind. And the unfortunate thing about it, and this is maybe where we could be some of some help, is people don't connect the dots. You know, a guy goes into a grocery store in Tennessee and shoots up all these people, mm -hmm. and we don't put two and two together that, you know, having espoused this policy that uh, violence will quell violence, uh, we don't realize we're sending a message that, that hurts us in our own domestic world. So I guess that mm -hmm. kind of got me to the other main point, too, which is what I kept hearing is the main, the main principle, that the, there's really two forces in the world, uh, the force of nonviolence and the force of violence, and the force of violence will tend to shift your attention to machines rather than people. And that's what I was hearing. Mm. Mm. Well, there is that uh, requirement almost that you... Uh, not see a person when you target a, a, a human being with a bullet or, or with a weapon. You know, something that comes to mind, Michael, is that Timothy McVeigh, who was a soldier in Iraq, had just been somebody, you know, he was a kid growing up in a small area. I, I don't quite know where exactly he grew up. I think it might have been in Pennsylvania. But anyway, he was just an excellent, as they say, marksman. He could hit the target really, really well with pop-up targets. He uh, got very, very high marks. And so when he was in Iraq, at first, he wrote, he wrote in a letter to his aunt, uh, that, and this is a direct quote, killing Iraqis was real hard at first, but after a while... Killing Iraqis got easier. Now, Timothy McVeigh went on to be the person who loaded up, I believe, a truck with explosives and attacked the Oklahoma Federal Building. And I always thought, who trained, who taught Timothy McVeigh to believe that killing people could be easy? And Timothy McVeigh was punished, certainly. But we've, you're right, we've punished ourselves, and we've now got you know, quite a large number of young people who have spent enormous hours playing video games and targeting blobs, you know, blobs on the screen. And so then Daniel Hale releases the actual documentation. He so bravely did that. He was an American analyst in Afghanistan, 
and later working for one of these security companies, and he realized by the U.S. documentation that they've created themselves nine out of ten times during one five-month operation he was part of, the target turned out to be a civilian, not the person they thought the person was. And so he releases the information. He is now serving 45 months in prison, years in prison. And so what was the last U.S. attack seemingly in Kabul? It's actually most likely not the last. A man was chosen as a target. His name was Zamari Ahmadi, and he was a father of several children, his he lived in a compound with two of his brothers and their family. He'd been going around Kabul to drop off people because he had a car and he could help them with that favor and pick up canisters of water for his family and finish last-minute tasks because he'd already been chosen to get one of these special immigration visas and come to the United States. The family had their bags packed, and somehow... Because he was driving a white Corolla, the U.S. drone operators and their advisors thought, this guy's picking up explosives. He's gone to an Islamic state in the Khorasan province safe house. He's going to go back to one other transaction at a compound that's related to them, and then he might go to the airport and attack people. They came up with this fantasy. None of it was true. Because all they can really see in their drone footage, camera footage, are blobs and fuzzy dimensions. And so then they fired the bomb, thinking there's only this guy and the person he's talking to. And Ahmad Zamari had a tradition when he would pull the car into the driveway. And really, owning a car in Afghanistan in a working-class neighborhood is a big deal. When he'd pull it into the driveway, he'd let his older son park it, and all the little kids would get in the car. It was just a thing they did. And so that was the last thing they did. Seven children, three of them under age five. The others, four teenagers, young teenagers, were all killed. Now, there was coverage of that. There were so many journalists that could get to the site and interview the survivors. But that sort of thing had just happened two weeks earlier. Another U.S. air attack had wiped out a clinic and a high school in Kandahar, in Lashkarga. This kind of thing goes on constantly. And so now the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, is seeking $10 billion in order to continue their, what they call, over-the-horizon attacks against Afghanistan. But who knows about this? Um, You know, very few people, I think, can see the pattern that's been going on since. I, I, I sort of only dated back to 2010 myself. I'm sure it happened before then. But the pattern is that an attack happens, whether it's a drone attack or a night raid. And it turns out that they, quote, got the wrong person. So the military if it's even noticed, we'll promise we're going to investigate that. And then if it doesn't slide off the news, if it doesn't just kind of evaporate as a story, if facts do emerge, yes, you killed civilians, this could be a war crime, then somebody takes the fall. In this most recent instance, they had to go to the top, and General Lloyd Austin said, We made a mistake. General McKenzie said, yes, we made a mistake. General Donahue said, yes, we made a mistake. But we need more than apologies. We need assurance that the United States is going to stop persisting with this policy of killing and bloodshed and torture and destruction We've got to see reparations, not only financial reparations, but also reparations that dismantle these wrongful and cruel systems. Kathy, 
how do you how do you think that people should go about those reparations um, including financial reparations and how does the Taliban play into that how can aid get mm. to people can you can you speak to that mm-hmm. well first of all I think we need to do what um, you and Michael have advocated in the Meta Center for a long time we have to find the courage to control our fears we have to become a public that isn't so whipped up into being afraid of this group, afraid of that group, that we will continue to bankroll efforts to kind of eliminate that group so that we don't have to be afraid of them anymore. That's one thing that I think is really important, to keep on building up our sense of controlling our fears. But a second thing, very practically, is to get to know the people who are bearing the consequences of our wars and our displacement. I think of Sherry Morin in uh, San Francisco and the Global Days of Listening uh, based out of uh, Olympia, Washington in some ways. But every month for years and years, 10 years now, I've organized a phone call so that young people in Afghanistan could communicate with very interesting people all over the world, including the two of you at times. And so I think that's important. And um, Sherry and others are now working so, so hard to help young people fill out the visa applications and to try to find ways of, to give very practical support to people who want to do you know, this flight, which is, I think, in some ways the only or the main nonviolent thing to do. So one thing people can do is to be in touch with Sherry Morin locally or um, stay in touch. I'm, I'm certainly happy to help anybody kind of buddy up, become a buddy to one of the people who's in need of help. These forms are complicated and they're difficult to um, figure out. The, the requirements change all the time. So that's one thing. Then with regard to whether or not there could ever be a peacekeeping presence in Afghanistan, there's a man named Dr. Zahar Wahab, and he's, he's Afghan. He's been teaching for many, many years in Afghan universities, but also at the Lewis Clark University in Portland. And he thinks outside the box. He uses his imagination, and he says, why not? Why not aim for a United Nations peacekeeping presence, one that would help to maintain some kind of protection and order. Now, would the Taliban ever accept that? It's clear so far the Taliban are uh, using their victory leverage, I guess, to say, no, we don't really have to listen to what international people are saying. It, it's difficult because um, – I, I don't want to recommend, well, then hit them economically, because I think that that will hit the poorest people economically. Sanctions always do that. They wallop the most vulnerable people in a society. And I don't think they'll necessarily really hit the Taliban officials. And, you know, they can raise money by charging taxes on every single vehicle that crosses any one of a number of different Borders. I mean, I, I, they've got loads of weaponry that they already possess because they took it from what U.S. bases and other places had left behind. So I don't recommend economic sanctions, but I do think that every diplomatic effort ought to be made to offer carrots to say to the Taliban, look, start to uh, respect human rights and teach your people to use methods other than beating people bloody with electric cables. Teach your people to accept that you've got to have women in every capacity in society if you're ever going to make progress. Start teaching that. And what would the carrots be? You know, I mean, Afghanistan is in economic freefall and facing a looming catastrophe. I mean, catastrophe economically. And they, they're in the fourth wave of COVID with a very badly battered medical system nationwide. And they've got drought in at least 24 out of 34 provinces. So being able to ride around in a pickup truck and brandish your weapons doesn't enable coping with those kinds of problems, which will unquestionably increase the frustration 
of a, a population that might become extremely resentful, which they're trying to govern. And Kathy, those are such practical ideas. Thank you. And, and I look forward to sharing them as well. Do you feel that the Taliban have been dehumanized uh, by the Western media, by the global media? And is there mm-hmm. a way to kind of break through that dehumanization and see why people joined the Taliban in the first place and uh, what ways we can interrupt that cycle of extremism? Uh, Stephanie, that's a really helpful question. And I have to you know, monitor myself in my own language okay. because th- I realize, even as you speak, there's, there's no such thing as the Taliban. Mm. It's a that's too wide a brush stroke, and there are many different groupings um, that comprise the Taliban. And then your question of why do people enter into those groups in the first place? Um, it was true not only for the Taliban but for many other warlord groupings that they could say to young people who wanted to put food on the table for their families, look, you know. We've got money, but you have to be willing to pick up a gun to be on the dole to get any of this money. And so for many young Talib fighters, they they didn't have a whole lot of other options in terms of being able to grow crops or cultivate flocks or rehabilitate the agricultural infrastructure in their area. And, you know, opium is the largest crop being produced right now. And so... Um, you know, that would bring them into another whole network of drug lords and warlords. So, you know, many of the young Talib fighters are probably people who would benefit from being able to learn how to read. And all of the, of the people in Afghanistan would benefit from being able to learn each other's languages, Dari and Pashto. And I'm sure that there have been images filled with hatred built up such that there are Pashtuns who think all Hazaras are second-class citizens and uh, not to be trusted. And Hazaras have built up images of all Pashtuns as being dangerous and not to be trusted. My young friends in Afghanistan were emblematic of people who wanted to reach out to people on the other side of the divide. You know, they talked about a border-free world. They they wanted to have inter-ethnic projects. And so if they distributed blankets to people who were in need during the harsh winters, as they did every winter, I mean, they saved lives, I believe, with these heavy blankets. The, they made sure that the women who were paid to manufacture the blankets were part from the Hazara grouping, part from the Tajik grouping, and part from the Pashto grouping. They really worked hard to make sure that they were being respectful of all three different ethnic groups. And then the same with the distributions. You know, they would make it a, make it a point of asking mosques that represented these three different ethnic groupings to help them figure out how to equitably distribute those blankets. And they did the same thing with the kids who came to their street kids' school and the families that were helped through that so that was a small project, and it was enabled by the generosity of many, many people, including many in California and many in Point Reyes. But you know, meanwhile, the United States government has poured billions, if not trillions, of dollars into wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think in the aggregate, they've widened the gulf between different groups and exacerbated the likelihood of people getting weapons and aiming them at each other. But you're so right to not accept the idea that there is, you know, another big blob called the Taliban. We we have to sort of step back from that, but then also kind of squint almost and try to see the humanity of, of the so-called enemies. Yeah, seeing seeing the humanity once again, Kathy, as we as we know very well, that that just changes your field of vision completely, changes your perspective, and you start seeing different things. I know one group uh, came up with some grant money for, I believe it was Afghanistan, and it was a while ago. 
gave them the money in the expectation that they would grow needed food crops. And uh, instead, the people grew flowers. And so they, they asked, you know, why did you do that? And they said, well, the land has to smile. Uh -huh. we, <laughs> we, we have to, you know, bring back the positive in, in some good life-affirming form. Uh, yeah, and it, it would be, you know, so easy if we changed our mental framework, as I say, from, you know, how can we pour more of the same oil on the same troubled waters, or where do we find a different kind of oil? That's what Voices of Creative Nonviolence and Meta Center have been working on so hard. We raise that, raise the banner of nonviolence, and immediately the violence falls into perspective. Afghanistan more than 30 times? That's right. Let's talk a little bit about your journey as a human being and, and how that experience has changed you. And I, I also want to give our listeners a sense of what it's like to be in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and not just in Kabul, but I'm sure you've gone into the provinces outside. And can you paint a picture of Afghanistan for us and the people? Well, you know, I have a friend, Ed Kanan, who was one of our a member of one of our earliest delegations to go and visit Kabul. And he very humbly wrote an essay saying he felt that he saw Afghanistan through a keyhole. And, you know, that's really true for me. I know one neighborhood of Kabul and um, was just thrilled on a few occasions to go to Panjshir, which is a a beautiful area where the emergency surgical centers for victims of war had uh, a hospital, and we, we, we were guests at that hospital for a week. And then a few occasions, kind of as a field trip, some of us were able to go to be guests of a former agricultural worker. He was killed, um, and he and his family would welcome us in the Panjshir area, and I, I visited people in Bamiyan. And then just on occasion, outskirts of Kabul, maybe for a village wedding. It was very, very enlightening to go into villages to the small extent that I did because some of the grandmothers in Bamiyan told me, you know, the practices that you hear about that the Taliban maintained toward women were going on for centuries before there were ever any Taliban. This has always been our way. So in the villages, in the rural areas, some women, not all, but some, would not notice a great difference between the rule of Ashraf Ghani and his government and the rule of the Taliban. In fact, the Afghan Analyst Organization has said that some people in areas where they sort of embedded themselves and just tried to see what's it like living in an area dominated by the Taliban, some said to them, you know, when it comes to issues of justice to resolve disputes over property or land, we prefer the Taliban courts because the courts of the government over in Kabul, which must have seemed, you know, very, very far away, are so corrupt. We have to keep paying for every step of the way and we, we run out of money and justice is meted out depending on who's got more money. So that's probably something that has affected people's lives, whether they're men, women, or children. When I would go to that working class area of Kabul, in more recent years, once I got into their household, I didn't leave. And then, whereas once we would stay for a month or a month and a half, our visits got shorter and shorter, like you know, 10 days would be more typical, because it began to be more dangerous for our young friends to host Westerners. It brought a lot of suspicion. Why are you, you know, connecting with people from the West? What are they doing? Are they teaching you? Are you, are you adopting Western values? Those were already sources of suspicion before the Talib overtook Kabul. I would say that 
the altruism, the idealism, the empathy, the leadership skills, the the good humor that I found amongst the young people that I was so fortunate to visit. It was always, always a, a very renewing experience. I, I could understand why an Italian nurse I once met, his name was Emanuele Nanini. He said um, he was going way, way up in the mountains with a big backpack on his back, and he was delivering medical supplies. And it was going to be his last time going because his four-year tour of being with the emergency surgical centers for victims of war was ending. And so people knew that he was going to be leaving them. And they turned out, they walked four hours in the snow in the winter to be able to say goodbye and thank you. And he said, ah, I fall in love with them. And I think that's the experience that so many have had. Again, you could ask Sherry Moore, and you just fall in love with so many wonderful, good, and kindly people who meant us no harm. I remember my young friend saying um, years earlier to me, Kathy, go home and tell the parents of young people in your country don't send your children to Afghanistan. It's dangerous for them here. And then he added very sadly, and they don't really help us. So there was always a sense, I think, on the part of the young people and some of the families of the young people that I met that they didn't want to harm people in the United States, but they, they didn't want people in the United States to keep sending soldiers and troops and weapons into their country. And and I remember when that massive ordnance air blast, the, the strongest, largest weapon, conventional weapon in, in the U.S. arsenal, short of the nuclear bomb, when that hit a mountainside, they were just shocked. They thought, you know, because people were calling it the mother of all bombs in the United States, and they just were utterly befuddled. Why? Why would you want to do this? Well, it turned out that inside that mountain, really, was a network of places to store weapons and kind of keep a secret guidance capacity for the United States militarism that had been built by the U.S. military many years ago. And the U.S. military knew it was there, and they didn't want the Taliban to use it or other warlords groups to use it, so they blew it up. I, I never heard such vigorous messaging about the value of abolishing war as I heard from these young people in Afghanistan. They were constant in sending that message. Can you paint a little bit more of a picture, too, of what it's like to be in that neighborhood in Kabul if you have to go out and, and how do you get your supplies and how did you overcome fear of potential violence? Mm. The scarcity of supply was always very real. Um, I remember being there one time and the water ran out, you know, done, through, over. And fortunately, the landlord took responsibility to dig for a well, and fortunately, after some time, water was hit, and so this crisis of no water was uh, somewhat alleviated. There were so many accidents inside the different households that the young people lived in floods and cave-ins, and the latrine situations were often quite primitive. Every time I went, literally every winter when I was in Afghanistan, the entire household would come down with some kind of respiratory infection. And three times I myself had pneumonia. I mean, I, I didn't have the immunities that they had built up, and I'm old. So people always faced health risks. There, the air quality was so horrible in the wintertime because in the poorer areas, people can't afford wood. They can't afford coal, so they start to burn plastic bags and tires and 
um, it, the smog would just create a, an air quality that was so terrible. I mean, literally, if you were brushing your teeth, you spat out black saliva, and that's not good for people. I'm amazed at the resilience of my young friends being able to manage through these harsh, cold winters. There's no indoor heating, so you know you put on all your clothes and you shiver a lot over the course of the day. I was also just so impressed by their readiness to bundle up, go up the mountainside, and visit with widows who had been pushed up the mountain, basically, because the higher up you go, the less water is available. And so the rents go down, and you've got women living on a shoestring, and, and, and the only way they can feed the kids is to send a couple of them down to the marketplace to scour the the you know the floor of the market for scraps of food or try to get some enrolled as child laborers and and so my young friends you know in a way they were they were doing surveillance a very good kind of surveillance with their notebooks and their pens asking women who were the only you know, adults in a household, there's no man to earn an income. The women can't go out and work. They've got kids. They'd ask them, how many times a week do you eat beans? And if the answer was maybe twice, uh, if they were mainly eating bread or rice, if they didn't have access to clean water, if a child was the main income earner, then they'd take that survey sheet and kind of put it at the top, and they went to those people and said, look, we think we can at least help you get through the winter. Here's the stuffing to make a heavy quilt blanket. Here's the fabric. You sew it up. We'll come back and collect it. We'll pay you, and we'll give them away for free to the refugees in the refugee camps. And then others, I mean, my young friend, Amapolo, who's now in India, he would take me to the place where he volunteered with the Jesuit refugee services, and he was a volunteer teacher. And these kids loved him. And he himself uh, copes with having muscular dystrophy. It's not so severe that he needs a wheelchair. He can still walk. I mean, I mentioned empathy. He had just tremendous empathy for other people who were dealing with circumstances beyond their control in some ways. And I just saw that again and again. So when I see kids saying, could another country take me? I think, oh, my gosh, Canada, the United States, the U.K., Germany, Portugal, Italy, any other country would, it should be jumping for joy to have these young people enter into their country, just as we should welcome every Haitian who wants to come here and, and acknowledge we've got plenty to share plenty of work to go around and if we are worried about money take the 10 billion away from the air force and tell them you know what we're not going to be able to fund your over the horizon capacity to kill people Kathy, I'm, I'm thinking of Biden's spokesperson with those images on the border with the Haitians said, you know, that they're horrific and that there's no situation in which that would be an appropriate response. And while I applaud that statement, it seems so rational and so humane, I, I think we could take that logic and also apply it to the bigger question of war. Is there any situation in which that seems like an appropriate response in 2021? You know, there are many, many, many families of Haitians here in the United States who themselves um, had a hard time, no doubt, crossing borders, but they would be ready to tell us, here's how you can welcome people into our communities. And I think we need to look much more at the grassroots capacities that communities have and free those capacities up. I mean, I, I'm positive that there are communities all across the United States who can remember when the Vietnamese communities entered into their cities and, and were just in awe of the industry and the uh, intellectual acumen and the, the goodness that 
so many of those refugees brought into our communities. I sure saw it in the uptown area of Chicago. So why would we want to just presume that somehow we're a sacrosanct superior group and we can't be invaded by people who want to come into our country? For goodness sakes, this country was the home of a native population that was massacred by the founders and their uh, followers initially, massacred because of settlers that were hostile toward them. And then every immigrant group that came over to the United States generally came because they were fleeing militarists and persecutions in their countries. So why why not have more empathy? Why not say everybody in, nobody out, take the money out of the military and take the weapons out of the toolkit and be able to find ways to become beloved all around the world so that there wouldn't be hostility. We wouldn't be seen as a menacing force. And it seems, too, the way that you've described the the people in Afghanistan and, and their generosity to you as a guest, uh, that's something that Americans can learn from Afghanistan. Well, certainly that sense of um, nonviolence encompassing a serious readiness to share resources, mm-hmm. uh, a serious readiness to be of service rather than to dominate others, mm-hmm. and a, a very serious readiness to live simply. You know, again, I want to stress that when I was in Kabul, I didn't know anybody who owned a car. I could so readily see why this man, Zamari Ahmadi, was considered, you know, the the go-to guy in the neighborhood. He had a car. The fuel consumption of Afghans compared to the rest of the world in, in terms of damage to the environment is minuscule. People don't have refrigerators. They don't. They certainly don't have air conditioners. Uh, not so many cars. A lot more bicycles. People live very, very simple lives. No indoor heating. People take their meals seated in a circle on the floor, and they share those meals with whomever might be coming in the door. And actually, this is very sad, but um, after every meal, you'd see one of our young friends put any leftovers in a plastic bag, and they'd bring them over to the bridge because they knew that living under the bridge were people who are among the millions who'd become addicted to opium. And sadly, another reality of war was that the although the Taliban initially had eradicated opium production in the 20 years of U.S. occupation in spite of billions being poured into counter-narcotics, the opium production uh, zoomed upward. And, and that's another way that it affects people in the United States as well, because with the volume of production of opium coming from Afghanistan, it lowers the price of opium, and that affects people from the U.K. to the U.S. and throughout Europe and the Middle East. Yeah, Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, The same thing has happened in Colombia, by the way. We go in there and bomb these fields and uh, try to eradicate coca and end up having exactly the opposite response. I wanted to share with you a couple of things. I was at a meeting in the U.K. one time, a long time ago, really, and this question of what we're doing in Afghanistan came up. There was a woman in the audience who had been to Afghanistan, and she was crying her eyes out. And uh, it really, of course, affected me very deeply. She said, you know, we're, we're bombing these, quote, mountains, unquote, and to us, they're just mountains. But they have systems for bringing water from the mountains down to the villages that have been, that are hundreds of years old. And mm. this is this is a kind of collateral damage that we don't take into account. So that that was mm. you know one thing, and the, the other is, is simply this. I'm remembering something that Johann Galtung said that he had interviewed a lot of uh, Arabic people uh, about terrorism, and he just determined he, you know he asked them, what do you want, and you know what they said we want respect for our religion. And mm-hmm. it, it would cost us nothing. 
And the same is definitely true for the Taliban. Of course, they have practices which no one can respect. But the basis of it is that when you disrespect people for something that's so intimate to them as their religion, they're going to behave worse. It's just, if, okay, okay, we'll do it more. You know, we, we will better the instruction, as Shylock says. We'd have to do something counterintuitive and reverse that psychology. That's what I'm and thinking. And I think also maybe recognize that the, the dominant religion, I believe, in our country today has become militarism. I think a lot of the rituals that take place in houses of worship in a way are smoke screens, and, and, and they prevent people from seeing that we really place our faith in the ability to dominate other people's resources, control other people's resources, and do that violently. And so be able to, because we have that, or anyway, we have had that dominance, we've been able to live quite well, uh, maybe with too much consumption, uh, with too much control of resources, because we expect to get other people's precious resources at cut rate prices. So I think... You know, our our religious practices have been as injurious to other people as those of the Taliban. You know, we may not be flogging people publicly in a an, an outdoor space, but you know, when our bombs these, for instance, when when a drone fires a Hellfire missile, can you imagine that missile? It it not only lands a hundred pounds of molten lead on a car or a house, but then the latest version of it is called the Jinsa uh, missile. It, it it sprouts almost like six blades. They shoot out like switchblades, but big, long blades that then, imagine a lawnmower, the old-fashioned kind, they start to rotate, and they, they cut up, they slice up the bodies of whomever has been attacked. Now, you know, that's that's pretty ghastly, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And imagine the Ahmadi children, that that was the end of their lives. So we have very bad practices, and nonviolence is truth force. And we have to tell the truth and look at ourselves in the mirror. And what I've just said is really, really hard to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that it's required to better understand who we are and how we can actually say we're sorry, we're so very sorry, and make reparations that say we are not going to continue this. Kathy Kelly, we we have just a few minutes left, and... You know, I wonder how you're feeling about, you know, Afghanistan really not being at the forefront of people's conscience for so many years until the United States pulls Mm. out. Uh, You've been interviewed on Democracy Now!, National Catholic Reporter. You know, you're all over the news right now. People want to talk to you. Uh, What do you think we have to hear to not let this go away when the headlines stop? pointing it out. What, what do we have to do? Mm, well, it's certainly true that more attention was paid in the last uh, three weeks than was paid over the last 20 years mm-hmm. to Afghanistan. You know, it's such a huge question, but I think that stories help us make sense of our reality. And so when you bring it down into the local community college or the closest university? Can we ask the tenured professors and the chancellors uh, to make concern about Afghanistan part of their curriculum, part of their extracurriculars? When we think about the houses of worship, the synagogues and the mosques and the churches, can we ask them, can you help us uh, create real concern for people from Afghanistan? Can we help bring refugees to our community and learn from them? 
can we have people who will buddy up with and be a communal resource for kids that are stuck in Afghanistan right now or for people that are, you know, really in dicey situations in Pakistan? Can we turn to our local, you know, food cooperatives and ecological groups and permaculture specialists and say, you know what, these kids in Afghanistan loved studying permaculture. Can we make connections in that way? And just keep on connecting, connecting, connecting. And, you know, I've, I've, I've asked my young friends in Afghanistan, do you want to think about writing your story? Uh, you know, maybe write an imaginary letter to somebody who was a refugee from another circumstance. So maybe we can do the same, you know, correspond and share stories. Thank you for asking that important question as well. All of your questions have been, it's like going on a retreat. I'm really <laughs> grateful for your time this morning. And thank you for listening. Thank you. You two always listen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And, and on behalf of our listeners, thank you very much. Kathy Kelly. All right. Great. Thank you. Goodbye, Michael. Goodbye, Stephanie. Bye-bye, Kathy. Till next time. Bye. All right. Till next time. We were just speaking with Kathy Kelly, one of the founding members of Voices in the Wilderness, uh, later known as Voices for Creative Nonviolence, and she's a co-coordinator of Band Killer Drones Campaign, an activist with World Beyond War, and she's been to Afghanistan nearly 30 times, has an incredible perspective. We have a few minutes left. Michael Negler, please give us a nonviolence report. You have been doing some deep reflection on moral injury after our last interview with Kelly Borhog, and I hope that you can speak a little bit more to how those thoughts have been developing in the next few minutes. Oh, yeah. that uh, I've written an article, and I'm preparing to write more, and the article is called Afghanistan and Moral Injury. And my main point is that these are two of several very l large, unmistakable signs telling us, go back, you're going the wrong way. The one, the Afghanistan one, refers to the fact that since 1945, the United States has spent, get this, $21 trillion. Just imagine what we could have done with that. $21 trillion on a long series of wars, none of which was, quote, won in the conventional sense. Reminding me of somebody who said, uh, you can't win a war any more than you can win an earthquake. But the other part of my article, Moral Injury, is about, on a very different scale, but even more telling in a way, what it does to a human being to participate in an injurious system and do injury to others. You know, for you know, we've always thought that, you know, ha ha, it's it's your problem, not mine, but even from neuroscience nowadays we can show that when you injure another person, that injury registers in your own brain. And if we would take that into account on the one hand, that you cannot injure others without injuring yourself, it's not just uh, you know, a moral truism. It's a fact of brain science, uh, though it is also a moral. Uh, there are moral forces in the universe. That side and also the fact that as a way of solving problems, it doesn't work anymore. We really would be motivated to find another way. So I'm going to highlight a group that as, uh, really seems very, very hopeful to me. It's a big organization like most organizations today that are making this kind of difference. It's collaborative. So many other groups like Training for Change and so on uh, are part of it. It's an outgrowth of Occupy, and it's called Momentum. And what I particularly like about it, because this is something that I think we've been missing for, for a long time, is that they're not just organizing, but they're very, very good at helping you organize for a particular purpose or a particular issue, but they're also doing 
training and strategy, and they're, they're working that out very scientifically. So that's, you know, that's an easy one to look up, just, you know, momentum. It's a very attractive mm-hmm. website, and everything about this group has just struck me as very encouraging, especially the fact, and we are here at Nonviolence Radio this morning, that uh, they do mention prominently at significant places that nonviolence is going to be adhered to in everything that they do. So that's momentum. Um, In addition to the article coming out, Afghanistan and Moral Injury, I wanted to mention that at the University of Toledo on the 29th of this month, September, there's going to be a showing of uh, our film. And there also was a showing recently in Raleigh, North Carolina, at the Triumphant Film Festival. I think they must have somewhere some record of everything that was shown. So what else is going on? Gosh, so much. We are just at the end of Campaign Nonviolence Action Week, which ended on the 21st, the International Day of Peace, not coincidentally. And I may have mentioned this before, but this year there were no less than 4,300 actions and events uh, of a nonviolent character taking place around the country. Coming up pretty soon, October 1st, the day before Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, at uh, Stanford University, our friend Clay Carson will be having an open house uh, where we can learn more about a very interesting project they've started called the World House Project. Mm -hmm. So go to the MLK Peace and Justice Center, Stanford, and look for the open house and carve out that time on Friday, October 1st. Mm -hmm. Also on Friday, October 1st, we'll be doing another screening of the Third Harmony film with uh, Ila Gandhi, who was on Nonviolence Radio uh, two weeks ago. And that will be in celebration of International Day of Nonviolence, and that'll be all the way in South Africa. But it will be available online. Michael, we didn't mention that September 21st was International Day of Peace. Uh, the, The Meta Center is... Uh, associated with the United Nations through ECOSOC. We have special consultative status. So this uh, world body is working on issues of peace and nonviolence. We're happy to help support that. And there's this kind of special time between September 21st, which is the International Day of Peace, and October 2nd, which is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday, also the International Day of Nonviolence, that a lot of important work can happen, hence campaign nonviolence, and uh, why it's so special for us to have somebody so dedicated to ending war uh, on our show today, Kathy Kelly. We're very grateful to our mother station, KWMR, to Kathy Kelly for joining us, to Matt Watrous for transcribing and editing the show, Annie Hewitt, uh, to Brian Farrell at Waging Nonviolence, who always helps share the show and get it up there. And, and to all of our listeners, uh, thank you so much for all of your support. And until the next time, please take care of one another. Bye.